Canada, a partially decomposed skeleton is found by the side of the road. Police suspect foul play, but determining who it is and time of death will be as tough as proving who committed the crime. In Colorado, a World War II hero is ambushed inside his house. Detectives enlist a battalion of metal detectors and a slab of roast beef to zero in on a killer. In a case of murder, the culprit may be a complete stranger or someone closer to home. To the astute detective and forensic specialist, the biggest clues often hide in plain sight. And what seems trivial to some is, in reality, critical evidence. Some of the names of the participants have been changed to protect their identity. In Ontario, Canada, spring thaw brings signs of new life. But on April 17, 2001, near the small town of Flanbury, the spring thaw revealed something far more gruesome. It was 3.40 p.m. when a jogger noticed a strange pile set among the weeds just off a rural highway. It was a horrific sight, a badly decomposed human body. The man quickly returned to the highway and ran for help. An emergency operator received the call and immediately dispatched members of the Hamilton Police Service. Officials cordoned off the area. Detective Sergeant Mike Thomas was put in charge of the case. Uh, when I arrived, uh, we saw a badly decomposed body uh, laying about uh, 12 to 15 feet from the roadway. But we're not... Uh, positive of what had happened, but we handled the scene uh, as, a, uh, as a major crime scene. There was little skin left, leaving the skull and bones exposed to the elements. Investigators had no idea if they were looking at the victim of a hit-and-run accident or possibly someone who had suffered a heart attack or some other serious illness and simply collapsed in the ditch. Their theory seemed unlikely when officials noted remnants of a black bra and nightgown. But it was the position of the body that intrigued pathologist Dr. David King. The left arm was down alongside the body, but the right arm was bent under the chest. It looked as if the body had uh, either been thrown or uh, rolled in that position. I thought that was significant. Typically in a hit, or hit and run, there are multiple fractures, the pelvis, the chest, what's called a bump of fracture on the lower legs. Dr. King observed no such injuries and ruled out that possibility. Detectives also found fingernails in the soil, a necklace and a wedding ring. The jewelry wasn't uh, extremely expensive jewelry, but it wasn't very cheap jewelry as well. Even though uh, through the decomposition, we could see that the fingernails uh, um, at one time were well uh, manicured and, and groomed, and uh, certainly we didn't uh, um, would not be consistent with uh, one of our street prostitutes that had been murdered and left out in this area. There was no way of knowing if the victim was a local or a stranger to the area. The remote site was adjacent to a farmer's field and not far from an African lion safari, an attraction that brought tourists from all over the province. 
the woman could be from anywhere. Her body was removed from the site and taken for autopsy. Investigators hoped they could find the clues they so desperately sought in the lab. Dr. David King performed the autopsy, declaring the victim to be female. The cause of death, blunt force trauma to the head. She had what's called depressed fracturing of the right side of the skull. That's in an area above her right ear. I think there were at least two blows, could be more, inflicted um, into the skull from the side. I think the victim was most, most probably taken by surprise, um, may well have been asleep in bed. Dr. King retrieved insect specimens from bodily tissues. The insects would help determine time of death. We did a, a number of other things to, uh, as we hoped, identify her. Um, uh, dental charting, we took samples for DNA. I removed several of the fingers with skin still on them in, in anticipation that uh, fingerprints could be obtained and she might be identified this way. Dr. Shelley Saunders, a forensic anthropologist at McMaster University, assisted Dr. King in evaluating the remains. The teeth are, if there's prominence of the, the area that where the teeth are She held, determined the victim's the age and ethnicity. The nasal area here, the profile of the na uh, nasal area. Looking at the I determined the individual was likely from Southern Asia, that is the subcontinent of India. Hamilton police contacted law enforcement throughout the U.S. and Canada, but there were no missing person reports matching that description. That was certainly uh, putting a huge wall up for us at the time, and um, our first priority had to be to, uh, to find out uh, who this uh, person was. To find the murder victim's identity, Detective Gary Zwicker was tasked with retrieving prints from the black mummified fingers collected at autopsy. I immersed them in a rehydration solution, checked them periodically, and I tried to obtain some prints. The rehydrating solution plumped up the mummified tissue like air filling a flat tire. The fingers were rehydrated, however, the skin was extremely hard and firm which didn't allow me to roll a proper impression at the time. If law enforcement officials couldn't identify who was murdered, they could at least figure out when. Dr. Dale Morris, a forensic entomologist, hoped to determine time of death using weather reports, mathematical equations, and data culled from bugs found at the scene. I found several different kinds of insects on the remains. The most important were the four species of blowflies. They lay their eggs on a dead body, sometimes within minutes of death, sometimes within hours of death. After determining the age of the insects, Dr. Morris simply counted backward from April. The insects had began uh, to colonize her remains the previous September came up with September 20th. Next, I have a media release that I will... On April 18th, 2001, one day after the body was found, Detective Mike Thomas held the first of several press conferences. April 2001, in the area of Concession 8. We often go to the media when we can't uh, identify a person. We released a number of photos uh, through the media, including the jewelry, the clothing that uh, the deceased was wearing. Tips came in, but uh, none of the tips uh, led to uh, any positive identification of the person. The things we'll be doing is... Uh, Weeks passed, and the police made no headway. Website. Uh, we'll be putting these pictures on the website. Uh, hopefully, that might uh, be somewhat of an identifier. Then, Detective Alan Yates of the Forensic Identification Branch of the Hamilton Police Service came up with an idea. 
The fingers had been hydrated and expanded from the inside, but their outer surface remained hard and immobile, making it hard to get a fingerprint impression. I washed them in warm water. Uh, I used a waterless uh, base lanolin cream, massaging that cream into the fingers, trying to rehydrate the uh, fingers to a usable state so that uh, I could develop a decent fingerprint. Yates could see ridges, the whorls, loops, and arches that made these particular fingertips unique. He attempted another print. This time, they got a usable fingerprint. Detective Yates went to the APHIS computer for a match. The automated fingerprint identification system is a database maintained by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. It contains fingerprints of immigrants and anyone arrested for a crime. At that point, I sat in front of the computer comparing print against print, doing that several hundreds of times. Yates thought he had a match, but was too weary to trust his own judgment. Figured I'd better leave it till the next morning, come in with a fresh set of eyes. Upon returning the next morning, I reviewed the fingerprint for a matter of uh, approximately uh, 10 or 15 minutes. And then at that point, I knew I had positively identified the unknown female. After seven weeks, police finally had a name to go with their body. In Canada, in 2001, the skeletal remains of a woman were found along the side of a rural highway. After seven months among the weeds and seven weeks as a Jane Doe, police finally knew her true identity. According to fingerprint records, her name was Yvette Boudram, a 38-year-old local woman with a volatile past. When the body was finally identified, that was the big break that we needed. Now we could move on to the next step of the investigation. Detective Mike Thomas of the Hamilton Police Service joined forces with Jamie Davis, a detective with the Peel Regional Police. I've got the file in here, Mike. It's got everything that uh, in relation to all our... Peel officials had arrested Yvette Boudram at her home on September 3rd, 2000. To the, fail to appear the charge, the assault with a knife, and making death threats against her husband. Uh, it also has in here all the notations. No, uh, no Yvette was released on bail, yeah, but disappeared no soon after, and never showed up for her court date. Now she was dead, and police wanted to speak with her husband. Mohan, just have a seat right here. His name was Mohan Ramkasoon and investigators asked him to come down to police headquarters. A decision was made to uh, not tell uh, Mohan Ramkasoon that his wife had been found dead. There was no evidence to say Mohan was responsible for the homicide. It was quite plausible that uh, he might know something uh, about her death, and we wanted to uh, explore it a little bit farther. I think there was a shooting? Where was that? Detective Davis conducted the interview. During the course of the interview, uh, Moen appeared to be uh, very credible, but there was an uneasiness that we all had. And our gut instincts told us that something just wasn't right with some of his responses and the way that he conducted himself during the interview. And, you know, this guy, his, his name's... The couple was from Guyana and had immigrated to Canada. Ram Kassoon admitted to a rocky marriage, but knew nothing of his wife's whereabouts. He believed she'd abandoned him and their two small children. He suspected she'd run off with her lover, a man named Harum Kumar. She'd last been seen by a friend on September 15, 2000. This was in sync with forensic evidence, which suggested well, time of death was well, September 20th, give or take five days. Hoping to learn more about him, Detective Mike Thomas spoke with Lisa Boudram, Yvette's daughter from a previous marriage. 
the woman had no explanation for her mother's disappearance. It didn't seem right at the time because my mother, she's got two younger children and um, she would never leave without calling them or visiting them or even letting him know where she is. So that was out of character for her. And um, it just, the whole situation was very odd. Lisa Boudram recalled an incident from the previous September. Mohan mentioned that he was having problems taking care of the children and maintaining the household and everything else. And I said to him, I would be up there. I'll come and help you. Her assistance, however, was not welcomed. Thank you. Thanks for coming. What I got from the conversation is that he clearly didn't want me at the house. And I was kind of worried, why would he not want me there? To detectives, such behavior seemed odd. But it did not prove murder. It came nowhere close. There was another person police wanted to speak with, Yvette's lover, Harun Kumar. Yvette's husband had heard that the man was a murder suspect, on the run from authorities in Tennessee. Thomas placed calls to the United States to find out more details. Uh, there was no question that uh, Yvette and Kumar were having, uh, were having a, a relationship, and it was quite blatant, and Mohan was aware of it. Um, it was important that uh, we make attempts to uh, locate Kumar and get his side of the story. That would be harder than expected. The next day, police met with a former roommate of Kumar. An illegal alien from Southeast Asia, Kumar had been hiding in a Montreal apartment in September of 2000. He'd been trying to avoid Yvette, to whom he owed thousands of dollars. He left the country and was smuggled into the United States the day that uh, that uh, Abet, uh, we believe, was murdered. That was uh, a suspicious event that uh, certainly uh, required further investigation. With Kumar on the loose, somewhere in America, investigators realized they had to break the news to Ram Kassoon. It was decided that we better tell Mohan that, he, uh, that his wife's been uh, found and, and uh, she has been killed. On June 13, 2001, Detective Davis called the man, asking him to come down to police headquarters one last time. We just wanted to give him the information face to face. We'll speak to you, but it is important that we speak to you as soon as possible. When I indicated to him that I wanted to speak to him again, there was a long pause on the phone. That's when he started doing. I contacted a lawyer. You need to. You can speak with my lawyer. And now, why do you think? This caused me immediate concern, because certainly in my experience, it is not uh, normal or usual for the husband uh, of a missing person victim to uh, contact a lawyer, and, uh, that uh, either his lawyer or he'll be back in touch with us. And I gotta tell you, like, when I told him we wanted him to come back in here, he sounded panic-stricken. That really concerned me. All right, we've got the surveillance. Fortunately, we had a surveillance unit that was available that morning, and um, they were watching Mohan. Mohan Ramkisoon left his workplace in the middle of the day, just minutes after his phone call with Detective Davis. Undercover officers tailed Ramkisoon to his attorney's office, where he spent a few minutes inside. Then he was off to a nearby shopping mall, to a destination that grabbed investigators' attention. He left work immediately, went over to a travel agency. A surveillance unit was right in the travel agency when he was arguing that he wanted the next ticket out of Canada to Guyana, three one-way tickets to Guyana and uh, the flight was uh, leaving in about 90 minutes and they were trying to convince him that you're not going to make it. 
Finally, Ram Kassoon gave in. Uh, it took some time for the travel agency to convince him to get the next flight on the following day. Two hours before his international flight, Ram Kassoon's car was spotted entering long-term parking. Police surrounded the vehicle. His children were swept away as their father was taken into custody. Put your hands up on the car. Dad! Daddy! Daddy, okay. Daddy, okay. Uh, when Mohan was arrested at the airport, uh, it was... Uh, he was just, uh, he could just feel the energy fall out of his body. Uh, it, it was like uh, he realized that the gig was up. Uh, uh, he wasn't going to be able to escape. He wasn't going to be able to get out uh, of Canada. When we searched Lo Mohan's luggage, we located some photographs of he and his family at the African Lion Safari, which of course was in close proximity to where Yvette's body had been found. Mohan. Oh, After he was arrested at the airport, we conducted about a uh, nine-hour interrogation of uh, Mohan. He uh, just uh, insisted that he was not responsible for this. Uh, unfortunately, he, uh, we could not get an admission from him on that particular night. And, uh, and a decision was made to, uh, to uh, release him. And should he make attempts to leave the country again, we continue to uh, maintain sur physical surveillance on him uh, so that we know his whereabouts at all times. Investigators obtained a search warrant for the Ram Kassoon home. Detective Dave Emberlin conducted the search. And we started in the bedroom because the victim was found wearing a nightgown. And upon flipping the mattress over, we noticed a uh, approximate two foot by 18 inch hole had been cut out of the mattress up near the top of the bed. That indicated to us that something had happened in this room and our job is to find it. We subsequently got on our hands and knees and started looking anywhere and everywhere looking for tiny, minute blood spatter. The floor was very shiny, the baseboard appeared to be uh, freshly painted. It was a very clean room. After about two hours of going over every square inch of the bedroom, we didn't find anything and it was starting to become quite frustrating because you, you have that gut feeling that something's happened here. They had found nothing. They were about to give up. And I just for unknown reasons, started to press the end of my flashlight, illuminating the light. But as soon as the light hit it, it was like jackpot. We've we found something here. On the television set was the critical evidence they were looking for. In June 2001, Canadian authorities were on the trail of a man who they believed had killed his wife and dumped her body in the woods. Detective Dave Emberlin theorized the murder had occurred at home, and a TV set gave him his first shot at real proof. Under normal uh, room lighting, uh, black TV, it, it didn't really show up. But under the flashlight, there it was. Detective Bernie Weber of the Peel Regional Police performed a blood test with a hemostick. In order to utilize this, uh, you wet the uh, hemostick and you place it on the stain, a chemical reaction occurs. If it's blood, it actually turns the uh, stick green. The stain tested positive for blood. Detectives returned to the mattress. There was a strange hole, but no visible blood stains. At least, not visible to the naked eye. A luminol test revealed the truth. A bloodied uh, object or person had been on the uh, mattress, and an object or a person which had been wet with blood had made contact with the side of the television, and then it moved across the face of it. Detectives also conducted a search of Ram Kassoon's car. Like his house, it was remarkably clean. 
free of stray hairs and fibers. And there appear to be no blood stains. Detective Weber once again applied the luminol. This was located on the weather stripping of the vehicle as well as the inner trunk carpet. DNA from the victim was compared to DNA samples taken from the blood stains in the bedroom and the stains in the car trunk. Blood stains from the television set came back inconclusive. All the other genetic profiles matched. All the evidence in this investigation pointed towards Mohan. Uh, the blood uh, around the, uh, the hole that had been cut out in the mattress was a vet's. The blood in the trunk of the car was a vet's. That information combined with uh, Mohan's actions um, when uh, trying to flee the country. Police were also able to eliminate Harun Kumar, Yvette's lover, as a suspect. Phone records and hotel bills provided him an alibi. Ram Kassoon had told police that Kumar was a murder suspect in Tennessee, trying to divert attention from his own guilt. You guys have the facts here from uh, the states here? For the cooperation. We were able to track down uh, Kumar in the United States, and uh, he was cooperative. Uh, all the information that he provided uh, to us was uh, corroborated. On August 16, 2001, Mohan Ram Kassoon was arrested at his home without incident. Detectives theorized that her husband sneaked up on her while Yvette lay sleeping. In a jealous rage over her blatant infidelity, he struck and killed her with a long cylindrical object, perhaps a bat or tire iron. February 2004, Mohan Ram Kassoon was found guilty of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison. The majority of homicides involve victims who know their killers. But when the killers are strangers and there is no motive, police are left scrambling for clues. October 20th, 1993. Just off a rural highway in Boulder County, Colorado, a cleaning woman approached the home of Walter Yoakum. When Yoakum did not respond, the woman went around back and made a frightening discovery. shattered glass from a broken window. Worried, she ran to contact police. Officer Kyle Miller and his partner from the Boulder County Sheriff's Department arrived on the scene. The cleaning woman informed them that her employer, Walter Yoakum, was an elderly man. For years, she was cleaning for him, for at least three years. Uh, and every two weeks, on those, he would open the door for her, and this is the first time that he hadn't opened the door. Deputies suspected one or more intruders might still be inside. What they found instead was a gruesome sight. An elderly man sprawled at the bottom of a staircase. Walter Yoakum was identified from his driver's license. The 76-year-old was dead, shot in the neck. Crime scene investigators quickly secured the area. Detective Tony Matthews was put in charge of the case. My first impression was it was going to be a difficult case to solve. Most murder cases typically are someone known to the victim. This looked like, you know, the victim had been at home, somebody came into his house and shot him. Detective Bruce Norton helped process the crime scene. At the point of entry to the house, there was broken glass, um, both inside and outside the window frame. And there was really good footprints out there that led up to the window. Norton worked on recovering the footprints 
while Detective Matthews checked out the interior. But investigators came up empty. They could only determine the obvious. The suspect or suspects appeared to have entered through a ground floor window, stepping in and onto a bed. Plaques and medals on the wall revealed that Walter Yoakum was a veteran and a hero from World War II. Mr. Yoakum was a uh, waste gunner in a B-17 in World War II, and he survived 34 missions over Nazi-held territory, which is, if you're familiar with history, that's quite a feat. I mean, you know, often in these raids, you know, 10, 10 or 20 or 30 percent of the planes would go down. So to survive 34 missions was amazing. The gunshot was a through and through. Matthews observed an entrance wound in the front of the neck, an exit wound out the back. Detective Matthews found small spatters of blood on the upper floor landing. It appeared that Yoakum had been standing at the top of the stairs when shot and tumbled down to the floor below. Under a nearby chair, the deputy found an empty holster but there was no sign of a gun or the fatal bullet. In any case involving a gunshot wound, you want to find the bullet because bullets can be ballistically matched to the weapon that fired them. They found no bullets embedded in the walls, just a strange powdery substance at the top of the stairs. The bullet had torn through the roof with only a few flecks of crumbled ceiling plaster to point the way. The bullet had traveled through Mr. Yoakum, and at an upward angle, it had gone through the ceiling and through the roof and out into space. So we then began searching outside the house. The entire roof of the house, the gutters, all of the areas right around the house, up, you know, basically to the entire property line, and we did not find that bullet. Without the bullet, investigators would not be able to identify the murder weapon, and this case would be nearly impossible to solve. Trip DeMuth from the Boulder County District Attorney's Office specialized in cases of violent crimes. Any disagreements? The first day when I was on the scene, I was walking, did the walkthrough and uh, was in the front yard. I was seriously doubtful about whether or not we would be able to solve this case. The only solid lead was a partial print made by someone wearing a lug-soled boot. Detective Norton made a plaster cast of the print. It turned out to be the first in a trail of steps that led police away from the house. Looks like it might be the same type going off in this direction from over there. Detective Norton followed the trail, hoping it would lead to more clues. Those shoe patterns actually went out across the field, up this little service road, and then um, across Dillon Road to another, like a pullout area along the side of the road. And we took several castings of the, the footprints that were alongside the road. Norton also found tire tracks. They were not deep enough for plaster casts, but confirmed his suspicions. The suspect parked a short distance away, which is real consistent with how a burglar operates. They don't want to park right in front of the, the house. And it appears to, appeared to us that it was probably an interrupted burglary. And once the, the homeowner was shot, the suspects left very quickly. They wanted to get out of the area. Deputies canvassed the neighborhood, but found no witnesses to the crime. Yoakum's next door neighbors had seen the man the day before. He'd been painting a fence and appeared to be in good spirits. To his neighbors, he seemed as kind as he was ordinary. He was a retired accountant, a widower, the father of two, with several grandchildren. They could not imagine anyone who would want to hurt him. At the Boulder County Sheriff's Department, 
Deputies, detectives, and crime scene technicians gathered for a task force meeting led by Tony Matthews. Matthews told his men to be on the lookout for a gun missing from Yoakum's home. It was a U.S. Army pistol, which he kept in the holster found at the scene. The family members were able to describe that in great detail for us. You know, it was the weapon that he had kept from World War II. That gun was his memento. Whether it was also the murder weapon, however, was still unclear. Yoakum's was a 45 caliber gun, but the bullet hole found in the roof was small and could have been made by a 38 Special. The first thing that so we needed is, uh, was to locate and identify the murder weapon and then put that murder weapon in somebody's hands. Desperate to find a witness, investigators distributed flyers yes, and conducted traffic stops. Good. I'm Officer Miller from Board County Sheriff's Department. We have uh, some flyers in here. We were looking for people that had driven by that day. Maybe they saw a car, maybe they saw somebody walking, that sort of thing. But detectives gained no useful leads. And I would have loved to have had a witness who had seen somebody leaving the crime scene, uh, but that wasn't the case here. So the only way to piece this case together was through forensics. To catch a killer, detectives would have to construct a most unusual forensic experiment, one that involved metal detectors, drywall, and a slab of roast beef. In 1993, 76-year-old Walter Yoakum was found shot to death in his Colorado home, the apparent victim of a burglary gone wrong. It was a brutal end to a heroic life. Yoakum had earned commendations for bravery in World War II. Detective Tony Matthews found no fingerprints, no weapon, not even the bullet that killed Yoakum only a series of boot prints leading to and from the house. We put the word out with all the local departments um, nearby, you know, anybody you can think of that's doing residential burglaries, let us know names. Yes, sir. The nearby yeah. Louisville police precinct okay. gave them two, Jason Fowler and Adam Bailey. Okay. They were kids that were doing that type of burglary. Louisville officials had tried to nab the two recently in a drug sting, but the duo managed to escape in a pickup with out-of-state plates. Okay. We ran the plate, and uh, the plate listed to a third person, uh, who at that time we weren't aware of. It was a man named Kevin Doctor. We're looking into a homicide here, and I had a name I wanted to run past you, of a local resident there. His name's uh, Kevin Doctor. One of our detectives called up to North Dakota to find out more about him. Coincidentally, he had been arrested the previous day. Of course, one thing led to another. We, we asked, well, what did you arrest him for? And they said, well, he's a convicted felon and he's in possession of firearms. And we asked, well, what kind of weapons did he have? And they said, well, he's got a 357 revolver and an old Army uh, 45, which then, of course, immediately piqued our interest thinking, okay, that's very likely going to be our victim's gun that's missing. That was the first lead we had as to who may have been involved in this case. With Doctor already in jail in North Dakota on a weapons charge, Colorado police had only to locate his accomplices, who were still at large. On November 2nd, 1993, two weeks after the murder, police spotted Adam Bailey in Boulder County, Colorado. Apprehended without incident. With his criminal record, he already was a habitual offender, and so he had a lot to lose. He talked to us fairly quickly, telling us that Kevin Doctor and Jason Fowler had done this burglary and that Doctor shot uh, Mr. Yoakum. Bailey claimed he'd learned about the killing from his friend, Jason Fowler. But when Fowler was nabbed by police, he asked for a lawyer and refused to talk.
If Bailey was telling the truth, one of the guns in Doctor's possession was likely the murder weapon. Kevin Doctor was in possession of a 357 Magnum and a World War II issue 45 caliber weapon. We needed to be able to prove both that that 45 was in fact the victims, and we needed to be able to prove that the uh, 357 in Kevin Doctor's possession was in fact the murder weapon. The main reason we got this boneless is to so determine if it was the murder weapon. Investigators had to find the elusive bullet. Locum was shot in an area where there was no bone. No bone was hit right there. Let me Detective open. Matthews enlisted the aid of Sheriff's Deputy Ray Sarno. Um, we have, the challenge uh, for me was to find the bullet, the needle in the haystack. And uh, I wanted to narrow down the haystack. He would need to find the fatal so we, bullet. We've got, we've got it in the right order because. He reenacted the shooting at a local firing range. And then it passed through the ceiling. It passed through the drywall. OK, I'm sorry, the drywall, which is the ceiling. We needed to determine what uh, velocity the bullet lost after it passed through the poor victim, and also the ceiling and the roof. And if we could determine that, then we could literally narrow the field down that we were going to search. We measured distances from uh, the shooter to the victim, and the victim to the ceiling, from the ceiling to the roof. Sarno used shingles and tar paper to simulate the roof, drywall for the ceiling, and a rump roast purchased at a local supermarket to serve as the victim. A chronograph would measure the bullet's velocity as it passed through each layer. Sarno used a 357 Magnum confiscated from Kevin Doctor. The gun can fire 38 caliber bullets, which investigators believed had been used in the crime. He aimed and fired. The shot was successful and went through the meat, it went through the drywall, it went through the uh, roofing material, and it did record on the chronograph. It registered. Get, write this down. The chronograph detected a reduction in speed, limiting the distance One, the bullet could travel to 700 feet. 1,218 feet per second. Yeah. Feet per second. Yeah. It did it. Okay, Scores of deputies and volunteers canvassed the property behind Yoakum's house. They used the test results to narrow the search area, focusing their attention 700 feet from the site of the murder. Metal detectors were uh, the key to the search because we were looking for something that was basically invisible. It could have been half an inch under the soil. So we needed to make the invisible visible. And I was determined, obsessed, tenacious, that I was going to find that murder bullet, if not me, somebody else on my team. After two days with no results, the search team became weary and disheartened. Perhaps all their work had been for nothing. Then, suddenly, a reading on one of the devices indicated the presence of metal beneath the surface. Within seconds, investigators found the bullet that had eluded them for weeks. Beautiful, beautiful. The bullet was sent to Agent Ted Ritter, a firearms expert at the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. It was in pretty damaged condition, being fired through the ceiling and on out through the rafters. The actual marks that would have been caused by it being fired through the barrel of a firearm had been overmarked, kind of like uh, if you compared it to taking a piece of sandpaper and sanding a piece of metal. It causes additional scratches on the surface of that metal. Well, that's exactly what happened on this fired bullet. Because of the damage, Ritter would not be able to match the bullet to Kevin Doctor's gun. Detectives soon got worse news. Kevin Doctor had made bail in North Dakota. Police had found their elusive bullet and lost their prime suspect. In 1993, Colorado authorities had arrested burglar Adam Bailey in connection with the slaying of war veteran Walter Yoakum. 
Bailey gave up his friends, Jason Fowler, who had helped break into the Oakham house, and Kevin Doctor, a career criminal who allegedly committed the murder. Detective Tony Matthews. We needed to have some evidence that would link Kevin Doctor to the crime scene. And what we really had at that point, we had the weapons um, and footprints. And that was pretty much it. Forensic expert Ted Ritter had been unable to prove that the bullet found near Yoakum's house was fired from Doctor's gun. He did, however, examine the specific chemical composition of the lead in the mangled bullet. He found it to be very similar to the lead in other bullets found in Doctor's gun. It was not an absolute match, but it was close. More good news came from North Dakota. Doctor was back in jail. He violated his bond and got rearrested. And when that happened, we were able to get his boots. The boots were sent to Special Agent Donald Sollers at the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. I used a fingerprint powder. I applied tape to it. I lifted it. Sollers created a transparent overlay, which he used to compare with the boot prints found at the scene. The general wear in the heel area and the ball area were consistent with the crime scene track and what was present on each of the boots. Again, another match. News that Colorado officials wanted to deliver to Kevin Doctor personally. He was extradited from North Dakota to Colorado. When confronted with the overwhelming evidence, the suspect eventually confessed to the crime. Doctor had entered the house alone, leaving Fowler outside as a lookout. Walter Yoakum was asleep upstairs. Walter Yoakum heard the, break, the breaking glass, um, and he had his gun handy. It was in a holster, he pulled it out, went to the top of the stairs, and probably was shouting down to find out who was downstairs or what was the cause of this noise. Um, Kevin Doctor was laying in wait at the bottom of the staircase. I was personally moved because I'm kind of a student of history and I've you know, studied a lot about World War II anyway. To me, it hits home what kind of sacrifice he made for, you know, his country and in the war, and then, you know, he makes it through all of that and then gets killed in his own house in that way. Jason Fowler pled guilty to burglary and received a 25-year prison sentence. Adam Bailey was charged with burglary and received probation in exchange for cooperating with prosecutors. Kevin Doctor pled guilty to second-degree murder. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison. When faced with a homicide, police must evaluate strangers and spouses alike. But with forensic tools like luminol, metal detectors, even supermarket meat, clever investigators can outwit the cruelest of killers while preserving the most critical evidence. A southeastern Virginia community is stunned by a crime no one can believe. A pregnant woman murdered, her baby lost. Across the state, another town feels a similar shock, a brutal random slaying in a most unexpected setting. Two crimes no one could predict, with no eyewitnesses, few clues, and killers on the run. To solve the crimes, investigators must find the fatal twist.
In this program, some of the names have been changed. In Chesapeake, Virginia, on July 6, 2000, Raquel Foley came to the home of her neighbors, Martin and Melissa O'Connell. One of Melissa's co-workers had called Raquel and asked her to check on Melissa, who hadn't come into work that morning and wasn't answering her phone. Still on the line, the co-worker asked Raquel to check a back door. It was unlocked. Melissa's car was in the garage. In the kitchen, it looked like a dinner was prepared, but not eaten. Melissa was known for being on time every day and was eight months into a difficult pregnancy. The bedroom door was locked. Something was wrong. On the advice of the coworker, Raquel dialed 911 and reported her concerns to Chesapeake police. Chesapeake officers and EMTs responded immediately. Melissa had developed gestational diabetes during her pregnancy. If she had passed out in the bedroom, she could go into a diabetic coma, endangering herself and the baby. They had to get to her. Unlike the rest of the house, the bedroom was in disarray. Then they discovered a body face down in the bathtub. The expectant mother was dead. It was too late to save the baby. Melissa had bruises on her body and there was some blood on the tub. Officers radioed in the suspicious death. About that time, Melissa's husband, Martin O'Connell, pulled up to the house. He said Melissa's co-worker had called, saying something about an ambulance. An officer asked Martin to wait outside until detectives arrived to speak with him. Homicide detective Tom Downing was on duty that morning. I heard the call uh, coming out. Uh, on the uh, patrol channel that uh, the investigators were uh, requesting the uh, forensics people to respond, uh, as well as the detectives. With Downing was his partner, Detective Mike Toothman. It is standard procedure for homicide detectives to respond to any suspicious death. An officer briefed them on what they knew so far. A dead body, signs of possible ransacking in the bedroom, an unlocked back door, and the woman's husband just informed of the death. Martin O'Connell was uh, sitting up against the front of the house, uh, adjacent to the garage door, with his head down. He seemed to be uh, very distraught, and I asked him if he would, wouldn't mind coming into uh, the vehicle so Detective Toothman and myself can interview him. Martin told the detectives he had been trying to get in touch with Melissa that morning. He hadn't seen her since the night before. He had indicated he had no idea what had, what had happened to his wife. During the interview, we were able to clearly observe a number of abrasions, uh, as well as a bandaged finger. When we questioned him about that, he said that he and his wife had had a fight the previous night. Martin sure? said that the night before, he and Melissa up. began arguing. No. You, what you meant is you At one point, he tried to quiet her by putting his hand up to her mouth. Oh, are you crazy? Get, away, get out! She was so get angry, out. she bit him on the finger, hard. Still finding her sex he said she kicked him out of the house, so he went driving around nearby Virginia Beach. She bit me, I put my hand up. He told Detective Toothman he tried to get back in touch with Melissa. He had called back to the house on his cell phone and left numerous messages on his uh, 
digital voice recorder. Uh, during that time, he was saying things about uh, being lost in Virginia Beach. Uh, Melissa pick up the phone. I'm sorry we fought. According to Martin, after several hours, he came back home, hoping he and Melissa could work things out. But in the garage, he found some of his clothes with a note from Melissa telling him not to come back that night. He switched cars and left. Not really sure. Martin told the detectives that he checked into a local hotel. I had asked him at this point uh, about the abrasions on his arms and elbows and the hands. Martin explained that after checking into the hotel, he went to a local bar and had a few drinks. Okay. And I see that you've got some fresh He said outside the bar, he tripped and fell, cutting his arms. The detectives asked if they could document the injuries. Martin agreed, saying he would do anything to help. The detectives next talked with Raquel Foley, the neighbor who first entered the house, and Cheryl Ramsdell, Melissa's co-worker, to get more information about Melissa. What we learned about Melissa O'Connell during this investigation was that she was just a, a nice person. She, uh, you know, did everything right. She was a loving, devoted wife. She couldn't wait to be a, a loving, devoted mother. Everybody that knew her uh, liked her, loved her, and uh, it was it was just a, a tragedy that uh, that she was taken so early. The women believed Melissa and Martin had a strong relationship. They also um, said Melissa was very security conscious, almost paranoid, and always kept the house locked tight. No physical, okay? All right, thank you very Investigators much. hoped the crime scene would provide some answers. Before processing the scene, senior forensics technician Nick Pazillo videotaped everything. The master bedroom was in a complete, total state of disarray. Everything was trashed. Uh, the drawers were dumped out. The rest of the house looked absolutely immaculate, except for this one room. It looked more like a ransacking than signs of a struggle. There was a lack of blood in the area. We didn't notice blood anywhere. Uh, and at that point, we really didn't know what we had. From the toilet, the technicians recovered a partially smoked cigarette. Around the tub, they found several broken candlesticks and a pair of shorts. Also near the tub were the first signs of blood for forensics technician Grover Davis. The water was discolored in the bathtub, and there was a little bit of staining around the bathtub area and the floor area. They collected samples for later study at the crime lab. To the investigators, it looked like a murder. Now they had to find out who would have wanted Melissa O'Connell and her unborn child dead. Police in Chesapeake, Virginia, were investigating the death of Melissa O'Connell, eight months pregnant with her first child. Evidence gathered in the bathroom where the body was found indicated murder. We were thinking that there was a, a good possibility that she may have been placed in the bathtub. Um, after she was killed. The investigators continued checking the rest of the house. Everything seemed normal. They confiscated the answering machine in case it held any clues. I surveyed the entire perimeter of the house uh, from the outside and the inside, checking all points of entry, all doors and windows. Uh, found everything to be locked and secured. There was no sign of forced entry with the exception of uh, the back door, which was open. Investigators believed the ransacking was staged. If the person came in to burglarize the house, why didn't they go to other rooms of the house where there were more valuable items than there were in the, in the bedroom? I was very uh, concerned uh, after leaving the crime scene because things just were not, were quickly not adding up. They needed more information. As promised, Martin O'Connell, the victim's husband, 
came to the police station that afternoon for another interview. Detectives were having a hard time eliminating him as a suspect. Family and friends had told police Melissa never allowed smoking in the house, so they believed the killer smoked the cigarette found in the toilet after the murder. We found that Martin O'Connell was uh, a smoker and that he did smoke that brand of cigarette. He again went over his actions on the night in question. The impression that I had was that he was very intent on giving us his alibi. But the detectives noticed that several times some small details of his story changed. They confronted him directly. The interview had started to turn into an interrogation. And at that point, uh, Martin basically shut down. He said he was tired, he wanted to go home. He agreed to meet with me the next morning and finish up the interview. And he also said that he would agree to a polygraph. What really concerned us was uh, the fact that he had never asked how his wife had, had died. He never asked anything about where she was found. Uh, didn't uh, ask any questions about the baby. And uh, this was uh, very significant because, you know, normally so that would be the first thing that somebody would want to uh, know. You know, they would wanna, they'd want to know these things. Perhaps the autopsy would provide more clues. Dr. Leah Bush led the medical team. When I first examined Melissa's body, I was struck by the number of bruises and scratches over her body, which indicated significant blunt force trauma. This woman had been beaten up. It was definitely a murder. Defensive injuries indicated Melissa fought back. She fought for her life. She tried to protect herself and her unborn child from being strangled and beaten to death. They had to prove who killed the mother and unborn child. Detective Downing asked Dr. Bush about Martin O'Connell's bite mark. Martin said he was facing Melissa when he put his hand up to her face. In your opinion. That is far more consistent with somebody having their hand over a person's mouth, trying to muffle their screams or using it as a control mechanism, and then she bit the finger because that on the side because that was the part of the finger close to her, such as this. And when she bit his finger, it wasn't a playful bite. A large piece of flesh was missing. This was somebody who was biting in an attempt to save their life. As each new fact emerged, Martin O'Connell looked more suspicious. But investigators had no solid evidence against him or anyone else. Homicide detectives Mike Toothman and Tom Downing still did not even know exactly where Melissa had been murdered. It had been made to look like a burglary, which we could tell it, it didn't make sense. It wasn't a burglary. Uh, we needed the forensics to tell us exactly what did happen. They secured a search warrant for biological samples. I called his attorney and I told him that I had a search warrant to obtain uh, Martin's DNA, his blood, and some hair samples. Uh, and uh, he, Martin, did meet me here at uh, headquarters, and we had the paramedics uh, draw the blood and, and pull the hair samples. The samples could be useful in later lab examinations. Investigators were trying to put together what really happened on the night Melissa died. Martin claimed Melissa bit his finger during an argument downstairs. Martin had told us that the actual fight, the confrontation that they had had the previous evening occurred in the living room. And I even had him show me exactly the spot where they were at the time. After his telling us that, of course, we had the living room looming old and processed, and there was no evidence of any blood there. Evidence technician Grover Davis began another search of the house, trying to determine where Melissa was attacked. The second trip that we took to the house, we found minute pieces of what we thought were blood or particles of blood on the door and it led all the way down to the floorboard 
and the and the uh, the uh, rug of the uh, of the closet. Um, we didn't notice it at first because it was so minute, and the closet itself didn't appear to be touched. It was a major discovery. We ended up sawing out some of the wallboard in the closet area, the, the floor area itself, a uh, piece of carpet from the floor, any area that we felt could contain any blood evidence or hair or slime, any bodily fluids. We sent those items to the forensic lab. Okay, good job. Police hoped the findings would point them to Melissa's killer. In July of 2000, Chesapeake, Virginia police worked to solve a heartbreaking murder, the beating and strangulation death of Melissa O'Connell, eight months pregnant with a baby girl. The prime suspect was Melissa's husband, Martin O'Connell, who had fresh injuries that he tried to explain away to police. His story seemed unlikely, and police hoped to disprove it with forensic science. At the Eastern Laboratory of the Virginia Division of Forensic Science, DNA examiner B.J. Blankenship compared the DNA from the bloodstain evidence collected at the house to the known DNA profiles of Melissa and Martin O'Connell. On the carpet, the original blood sample that I found uh, matched Melissa's blood. I then went back later and found several other uh, lighter blood stains that one of them matched Martin, and three others were a mixture of blood between Martin and Melissa. When they're mixed together, that means that they were present together at the time the blood was shed. Then the examiner made another important discovery. As I was examining the carpet from the closet, and as I looked down, I noticed something beside the blood stain that was red. So I picked it up with my forceps and looked under the microscope to see what it was, and lo and behold, it was a piece of skin. And you could even see the ridge detail on the skin. The ridge detail meant the skin came from the bottom of a foot, a palm, or a finger. I immediately called the, the police department to ask them if the defendant had any wounds, and he did, in fact, have a wound on his finger. To Dr. Blankenship, it was clear that Martin O'Connell was lying to police and that he was there when his wife was killed. Martin O'Connell told the police a story that the struggle occurred with his wife downstairs. The forensics told us a different story. It said that it happened upstairs in the closet. That's where the original fight occurred. Investigators kept looking for more circumstantial evidence. Melissa's friends had said the couple seemed happy, excited about the baby. But when detectives spoke to Martin's friends, they got a different story. What we had learned is that uh, he really was not planning on being a family man. I mean, that was the far furthest thing from his lifestyle. Detectives also heard unsettling news. Martin had left town. Several friends believed he was now living with relatives in Florida. Martin left the state without submitting to the polygraph examination he promised detectives he would take. Because he had not been charged, leaving was not a crime. But it was certainly suspicious. The Chesapeake detectives contacted police in West Palm Beach, Florida who agreed to set up surveillance at the condo of one of Martin's relatives. Soon, they spotted the suspect. While West Palm Beach could not maintain 24-hour surveillance, they would do regular checks to try to keep an eye on him. In Virginia, detectives were still hoping to figure out the motive for the murder. Then, detectives received a call from a woman in San Diego, California, who said she had an affair with Martin while he was working in the area for a few months that year. 
with her. When she learned of Melissa's death, she told them she was compelled to call. Based on that information, myself and Detective Toothman went out. We flew out to San Diego and interviewed a young lady. And we had learned a lot about Martin. Um, sometime he was at, May, actually in San Diego for an extended period of time, and he had met her. But he never told this young lady that, that he was married, and certainly nothing about a, a, a child on the way, a close relationship. Yeah. He told the young woman he wanted her to move to Florida so they could be together. After you found out he was married, so did you tell you at that point, uh, I think that we realized that we had the motive. And please um, give me a call if anything comes to it mind. It was time to bring in Martin O'Connell, if they could find him. After several weeks, Chesapeake police were ready to arrest Martin O'Connell for the murder of his pregnant wife. But the suspect had fled to Florida. He had been spotted at a relative's condo in West Palm Beach, but then disappeared. A West Palm Beach deputy tried a ruse to find him. He spoke to the relative about a property damage report Martin had filed with the condo association, saying he needed to talk to Martin about it. The relative said she did not know where Martin was, but would try to have him call. The next day, the deputy received a message from Martin O'Connell with a phone number. He called the number and told Martin he needed his signature on a form about the damage claim. Martin asked him to fax it, but the deputy insisted he needed the original signed. He had to have an address. Reluctantly, Martin gave him the address in Clearwater, Florida. The deputy immediately called the Chesapeake detectives and gave them the address. Okay, thank you very much. They, in turn, called police in Clearwater and told them about the case and their arrest warrant. Clearwater PD agreed to attempt the arrest. That's him. Officers set up surveillance at the Clearwater address. It wasn't long before Martin O'Connell showed up and was safely taken into custody and extradited back to Virginia. Prosecutors and detectives worked together to bring this emotional case to trial. In June 2002, a jury agreed on what happened the night of Melissa O'Connell's death. Just weeks before the baby was due, the couple had an argument. In Melissa's walk-in closet, Martin attacked. When he tried to stifle her screams, she bit him fighting for her life, but he was too strong. Martin O'Connell was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. At the time, Virginia law made it impossible to charge him with killing his unborn daughter, too. But because of this case, that has changed. The city of Chesapeake was shaken to the core by the brutal crime. Three hundred miles to the west, another Virginia town was in for a similar shock. On the afternoon of October 11, 1990, Roanoke police officers Michael Warner and Tom Kincaid were preparing for their shift when a man pulled up in a rush. Yes, sir. He exited the car and he was very nervous and he told us that uh, there had been a woman that had been killed in a, a basement at a subdivision just up the street. Uh, at that time we kind of wondered if it was for real. We asked him, was he kidding us or, or joking with us? It was no joke. The officers asked where the house was. And he said that he could take us there if we'd follow him. So we went ahead and followed him up to the house. Officers called in the report of a possible dead body. 
At the house, two women were waiting. They said they were local realtors. The woman inside was a co-worker. She was in the basement, dead. The officers had to clear the house to make sure no one dangerous was inside. In the kitchen, they found a realtor's notebook and business card. They headed to the basement. In a large pool of blood lay a body. Uh, we were pretty confident looking at the victim that she was deceased and there was no uh, immediate first aid that we could give her. The officers called for detectives and crime scene technicians. And what time do you arrive? Outside, the okay. other realtors said the dead woman was named well, Carolyn Rogers. We're not aware of. The co-workers had come to the house looking for Carolyn when she didn't show up for lunch and found the body. None of them had seen anyone leaving the house. Roanoke County Police forensic evidence technicians soon arrived. It was up to them and the medical examiner to find the clues left behind and determine what happened inside the house. Also responding were county detectives. They would try to use those clues to find whoever was responsible. The patrol officers briefed the others on the apparent homicide. What we have inside is down in the basement, we have a white female gentleman here is found behind me. I've interviewed him. Detective Phil Patrone knew the evidence search was critical. That's kind of where we're at right now. We had no eyewitnesses that we were able to determine immediately. We had just the victim in the basement. Forensic evidence technician Rick Moorer helped process the basement. We carefully went through the scene. We began to photograph it using a 35 millimeter camera and uh, documenting it through sketches and so forth. Medical examiner William Masello checked the body. This was uh, a middle-aged woman that was uh, lying face down, and there was a, a large pool of blood around her. Very obviously, she had uh, sustained some sort of an injury which had resulted in bleeding, be it a gunshot wound, stab wound and all. I didn't really know what it was until I got into uh, further examining the body. Body temperature indicated the woman had been dead for several hours. Here. The most obvious clues were the bloody shoe prints. Preserving them was crucial for forensic scientist supervisor Michael Grimm. At the scene, we took photographs of footwear impressions. And included in the photographs were scales to assure proper enlargement of the impressions once they were returned to the lab. A number of the impressions appeared to have been made by a female shoe based on the shape and size. In addition to that, there were footwear impressions that appeared to have been made by a much larger shoe, one with a large heel and a large sole area. The technician searched for any other clues. I discovered a, a small button that was laying in the blood. I felt that that was very important. That button did not match any of the buttons that Mrs. Rogers had on. So uh, we were very careful to collect that. The evidence suggested to police that this was definitely a murder. Investigators then looked to determine their first lead. There were no vehicles at the house. She was a realtor, and if she had to get there somehow, so we assumed then, at least, that the car was stolen. When police contacted Carolyn's family, they learned details about her car and put out an all-points bulletin for it. Lieutenant Warner was part of the force out looking for the car. 
I started concentrating my efforts on large parking lots, and motel rooms, and stuff like that in the area. And approximately 9, 30, 10 o'clock that evening, I was at the mall and I happened to spot the vehicle. Uh, once I did, I laid back and watched it just for a few minutes. I noticed that there was nobody hanging around it. Dispatch, I'm going to be out on John Lincoln Charles 7865. Warner called in the discovery and did a cursory check of the vehicle. The door was locked. But inside, he could see a legal pad. The pad looked like it had blood spots on it. If so, it could help lead to the killers. Investigators sent the pad to the crime lab for immediate analysis. Roanoke Police Chief Ray Lavender looked for other clues. We immediately notified security at uh, the mall uh, where the car was located that uh, if any other evidence or suspicious activity occurred in the area, we would like to know about it immediately. Any articles of clothing uh, that might indicate a person had changed clothing, anything at all like that. Next morning, they got a call back. Some of the maintenance personnel at the mall had located a pair of shoes and had thrown those shoes into a dumpster. We immediately went to that dumpster. We located the shoes. They had uh, small heels uh, similar to the type of shoes that may have walked through the blood at the crime scene. We labeled them uh, and uh, tagged them and immediately took them uh, as evidence and later submitted them to the lab. The investigators tried to work quickly Whoever committed such a senseless and vicious crime had to be stopped fast. Roanoke, Virginia police believed two people were involved in the brutal slaying of realtor Carolyn Rogers. Technicians found two sets of bloody shoe prints at the scene and collected a legal pad with possible blood stains from the victim's car. Yet investigators had no idea who the suspects were or where they went. They hoped more information would turn up at the autopsy. Assistant Chief Medical Examiner William Masello led the post-mortem examination. Cause of death in this uh, individual was a stab wound to the chest going right, right through the heart and the left lung. At the edge of the fatal wound, the doctor noted scalloped markings. And uh, these were very suggestive of a uh, stake-type knife or a knife with a serrated blade. The doctor also discovered a distinctive pattern of bruises on the back of the head. So this is the type of the thing you might see when some sort of an object uh, strikes the head. The wounds were photographed for comparison in case a weapon was found. The victim's family had said she always wore nice jewelry, yet none remained on the body. Bruises indicated someone had forcibly removed her ring and earrings. Got this from the bank. Though still shocked and grieving, Carolyn's husband did what he could to help. Are those the three checks here at the bottom? He had reviewed the couple's bank accounts and discovered a check cashed the day of the murder. Marcia J. Smith. $500 for house cleaning services. We don't have a house cleaning service detective. He told Detective Phil Patrone it was a forgery. our checks. Made out to a person that Mr. Rogers didn't know. In fact, Mr. Rogers made it very clear to us that they didn't have a house cleaning service. A detective went to the bank and spoke to the manager there. The manager had saved the canceled check, made out to a Marsha J. Smith. At the Virginia Division of Forensic Science, examiners did the processing. 
To develop any unseen fingerprints, the forged check was sprayed with ninhydrin aerosol. Ninhydrin reacts to secretions from human skin that transfer easily to porous surfaces. The legal pad found in the victim's car was also processed. Forensic scientist Michael Grimm introduced heat and steam from a household iron to cause the reaction. Several partial fingerprints were revealed. He then turned to the legal pad. During that examination, a fingerprint was developed in the lower right-hand corner on the front page of the notepad. This fingerprint was photographed and subsequently entered into Virginia's automated fingerprint identification system also known as APHIS. Within a matter of minutes, a potential hit was returned uh, to the laboratory. It was for a woman named Wendy Horst. Detective Patron called in the hit. An address was found for Marcia Smith, whose name appeared on the forged check. Detectives traveled to Blacksburg, Virginia, to interview her. Wendy Hurst. Do you know anything about Marcia did know Wendy Horst. She used to work with her. And Marcia had recently lost her license. My driver's license. It was all around the same time Horst left town. Detectives believed Horst stole the license then used it to cash the forged check. Thank you. Detective Kern soon received a background check on Wendy Horst. She was the girlfriend of a known violent offender named Danny King. Danny was pretty much a career criminal. He had been involved in a number of crimes, a number of violent crimes. He had just gotten out of uh, prison. He'd been out of prison 10 days when this offense occurred. Danny, uh, just absolutely uh, a ruthless uh, criminal. Roanoke police went to King's last known address and yeah. spoke with a relative there. Yes, I am. She was a very cooperative person. She was very uh, sorry for the uh, reasons that we were there. The woman yes, said Wendy I'm Horst had lived with her yes. until Danny got out of prison recently. Saw him. What were they doing? She had observed a license plate taken off the female accomplice's vehicle, put onto a van that uh, Danny and his accomplice had just driven in with one day. Uh, on the 11th. The and day after the Rogers murder, the couple left town. And they were in a rush to leave. Investigators did not know where the pair had gone but now they had a license plate number. They entered the plate, as well as descriptions of the van and the two suspects, into the National Crime Information Center's computer system and put out a nationwide teletype requesting law enforcement agencies across the country to look out for the couple. The chances were slim. The couple could be anywhere. Then, on October 15th, just four days after the murder, a state trooper on patrol in New Philadelphia, Ohio, spotted a van at a rest area. November Charlie, 7406, on a gold he called in the plates and learned the van was possibly connected to a murder in Virginia. 518, if you'll send me a 10 The trooper called for backup. backup yeah. Two brutal killers might be inside. Four days after realtor Carolyn Rogers was murdered in Roanoke, Virginia, police 350 miles northwest in New Philadelphia, Ohio, spotted the van associated with the two suspects. As soon as other state troopers arrived as backup, they moved in. Test, stick your hands out the window. 
driver, get your hands out the window. Hands out the window. In the passenger seat was Wendy Horst. Come out of the car nice and easy and face forward. The driver was Danny King. The two were taken into custody without a struggle. She ain't got nothing to do with this. She ain't got nothing to do with this. In their preliminary search of the van, Ohio troopers noticed a key ring with the logo of the victim's real estate company. They also spotted a knife, a knife. with a serrated blade. Okay. Ohio on. authorities contacted Roanoke Police Chief Ray Lavender. I had uh, received word from the Ohio Highway Patrol that they had located uh, uh, Danny King and his accomplice. I got the first flight out of Roanoke, which was about 4 a.m. the next morning. After getting a warrant, the Roanoke police conducted a full search of the suspect's van. They found some clothing, both male and female, that appeared to have blood on it. One piece caught their attention. We also located a work shirt uh, with a missing button. And the reason that was important to us is that we had found a button at the crime scene. And the buttons on that shirt were identical to those we found at the crime scene. Uh, we also recovered a pair of boots that we believe belonged to Mr. King. We were particularly interested in those. Their soles would be compared to the bloody crime scene shoe prints. That tread pattern looks very familiar. Investigators also collected the knife Ohio troopers had spotted. After collecting the evidence, the detectives went to interview Wendy Horst. She admitted to forging the check and pawning the ring. She said that she was present at the house at the time of the murder, but swore she did not see it actually happen. She said that she really didn't know what happened, uh, that uh, Mr. King was in the basement with a real estate agent, and he came out of the basement, ordered her to get in the car and drive. Uh, to the local mall. As the interview continued in Ohio, examiners in Virginia processed two more forged checks that had been recovered. Prints were lifted from the new checks and compared to King's known prints. Those fingerprints were positively identified as fingerprints of Danny King. That's it, that's it. It was time to interview King. No, 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 King denied having anything to do with the murder. He didn't find my fingerprints. There would be no confession. Well, I'm just to prove you, what happened, investigators turned to forensic evidence. So maybe they're wrong. Michael Grimm checked the shoe prints photographed at the scene against the recovered shoes. The examiner reported a strong association between the high heels and the smaller crime scene prints. And a positive match between the boots and the larger prints. Next, he checked the reproductions and inked impressions of the suspect's feet against the wear on the inside of the shoes. He reported similar findings. Horst could not be eliminated as the primary wearer of the heels, and Danny King was an exact match with the boots. It is our opinion that these characteristics are unique to that shoe. The lab findings were exactly what Commonwealth's attorney Randy Leach needed for trial. It would have been a very difficult case to prosecute without the forensic evidence. In June 1991, the prosecutor used the forensic evidence to prove to a jury what happened to Carolyn Rogers. She can't meet us at like 10 in the morning. Okay. Cool. Okay. Don't use your name. Danny King had his girlfriend call some realtors, allegedly to look at a house. See if she can meet us earliest time. 
Carolyn Rogers had the misfortune to and take the like call. Get one of your houses on Jefferson Street? Yes, the morning would be best. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. Cool. So you meet us? Pure and simple, the motive behind the crime was robbery. Danny King had been in the penitentiary for a number of years and had been out for 10 days. He had no income, and the crime was committed to get Carolyn Rogers jewelry, her checkbook, any cash she might have had, so they would have money to go out of state on a honeymoon trip. Very expensive, well-made cabinets. Brand new. Windows, right now, it's not finished. But you could have actually, uh, you can make this into two or three bedrooms or a big family room for children. That's when they got to the basement, King's girlfriend decided to go outside for a cigarette. Yeah. I'm gonna go have a cigarette. Leaving yeah. Danny um, King alone with yeah. Carolyn. My name is Jill. Danny King was a dangerous man. He didn't care who he had to hurt to get what he wanted. He killed her and robbed her. They parked the victim's car at a local mall where Danny wiped it down to get rid of any fingerprints. Get in the bed! Take off your shoes! Leave them! He made his girlfriend leave her shoes. He thought he had erased any trace of their passage, any connection between them and the murderer. Roanoke investigators and lab examiners found all the evidence they needed. You know Fingerprints, shoe prints, even a shirt button. We were able to show the jury that not only had he stabbed her, and not only did she die a horrible death there, but that she had been stomped in the head with his boot. That went a long way toward convicting Danny King and, and the ultimate punishment being imposed. Danny King guilty of forgery, robbery, and murder, and recommended the death penalty. He was executed on July 23, 1998. His accomplice was convicted of accessory after the fact and received five years. She has since been released. Many homicide victims place themselves in dangerous situations. When the purely innocent are taken, police and forensic examiners work especially hard to find answers in the fatal twist. A young Michigan woman accepts the job of a lifetime and disappears. Now it's the authorities' job to find her. The only clues are some suspicious emails and her new employer's shady past. In New York, an ambitious college student has her whole life ahead of her until she crosses the path of a killer. It's a random murder, the hardest kind to solve. But forensics reveals an unexpected pattern, leading to a game of cat and mouse with the prime suspect. Clues, eyewitnesses, police records. All of these help investigators. But each provides small consolation when the victim or the killer has vanished. In this program, some of the names have been changed. March 25th, 2000, Newport, Michigan. 
call it a mother's intuition. When Carolyn Troughton received an email from her daughter Suzette, who'd moved out of state, it was supposed to reassure her. Instead, she called the police. Tactical operations, Anthony Burnell, may I help you? The Overland Park, Kansas police dispatcher connected her with the missing persons unit. Mrs. Troughton explained that Suzette left for Kansas to work for a man named John Robinson. Suzette had packed her belongings and taken her dogs, promising to write or phone. But her mother hadn't heard from her in weeks until she got the email that didn't sound like her daughter. Detective Greg Wilson of the Overland Park, Kansas PD was assigned the case. Experience told him it was not unusual for young people to move away from home and lose contact with their families. But Suzette, it seemed, was an exception. Suzette would contact her mother by phone, as well as emails, at least two or three times a day. Since she had moved to Kansas, the contacts immediately dropped off. So that was of concern to Suzette's mother, as well as the fact that she said that there was never in her in Suzette's life more than two or three days at a time that Suzette would go without speaking with her mother. When she left, Suzette, a nursing student, was excited by the opportunity to care for Robinson's elderly father. Police became concerned when they learned about her employer. John Robinson was known to uh, some of the investigators in Overland Park uh, that had dealt with him back in the 1980s. And they knew that he um, had, had been a longtime career criminal. In the 1980s, Robinson had been linked to several missing girls, but had never been charged with any crime connected to their disappearance. Investigators from the Overland Park Police wanted to gather all possible information about Suzette's whereabouts before confronting Robinson. Police went to her last known address, a motel. Hi. I'm Detective Bobby Hummel with Overland Park Police Department. My partner, Greg Wilson. The clerk recalled Suzette because she had two little dogs, which weren't allowed. Once Suzette was told about the policy, the clerk never saw the animals again. The clerk said Suzette's room was paid for by Robinson. He put the room on a business account from a company called Specialty Publications. And there's your receipt, Mr. Robinson. Thank you. Suzette stayed at the hotel for 16 days and had checked out on March 1st, almost three weeks earlier. Think of anything else? Could you the clerk me provided the security camera tape Thanks. from that date, Thanks. which provided investigators with a current picture of Robinson. Then, detectives spoke with the housekeeper, who recalled that Suzette had occupied room 216. She remembered that on the day the girl checked out, a man, matching Robinson's description, loaded her luggage into the back of a pickup truck. The housekeeper even described the truck and the luggage. The motel was Suzette Troughton's last known location, but it was located outside Overland Park's jurisdiction. The investigators brought in the Lenexa, Kansas Police Department to help them with this baffling case. Detective Wilson met with Sergeant Rick Roth of the Lenexa Police sharing what he'd found at the motel. Wilson also told Lenexa PD that this was not the first time they had heard of John Robinson. We had some good background information on John Robinson, and certain aspects of the disappearances of the girls in the 80s kind of meshed with the disappearance of Suzette. In the previous cases of missing women, investigators could never find enough to prove their suspicions. And Robinson proved a difficult man to investigate. The things that really didn't work in the 80s, going and talking to Robinson right away, uh, what that did to him, for him is it let him know that law enforcement was looking at him, that they were actively looking for these people that were missing. Police believe this gave Robinson time to cover uh, his tracks. 
Sergeant Rick Roth wanted to talk with the retired detectives who worked the earlier case. We're going to give it a try. We brought them in, interviewed them. Uh, we had their official reports, however, you know, we wanted to get a little further and get their personal views, what went correct in their investigations, what went wrong, their gut feelings, the little tidbits that were not in the police reports. The more he learned about Robinson, the more Detective Roth began to fear he was running out of time if he hoped to find Suzette Troughton alive. The detective started by trying to track down Suzette's missing possessions. Five, 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 three, three, four, four. They made cold calls to area mini storage companies, yes, hello. looking this for one that rented space to John Robinson. Yes, thank you. They found one. Detectives went there as a punch key entrance, obtained the records, and found out he had actually been there on March 1st. That was the same day Robinson checked Suzette out of the motel. Investigators next focused their attention on trying to find her dogs. The family had told us that if we found Suzette's dogs, that something bad had happened to Suzette. Uh, they were like her children. Officers used the same cold call technique and found Suzette's two dogs. They were adopted after being left at a shelter. Investigators now feared their missing persons case had become a homicide investigation. When we did find the dogs, it was kind of confirmation on our feelings that she was, in fact, uh, dead. As police began to fear they might never find Suzette Troughton alive, all they could do now was work to try to find her killer before he struck again. As police continued the search for a missing girl in Kansas, they focused their attention on the man who had last seen her, a career criminal named John Robinson. Police wanted to keep a close watch on Robinson, but they didn't want to make him aware of their investigation. Sergeant Rick Roth. From the lack of luck in the past interviewing John Robinson, we were not going to contact him. And basically, we threw every detective we had into the investigation. Police put Robinson under surveillance. He was married and living with his family in a modest home. For seasoned investigator Don Lehman of the Lenexa Police Department, his habits seemed odd. He would do activities during the day, mainly by himself would go and visit women that he had coming into town. Um, he would meet them at hotels. Most of his activity during the day was outside of the family, whereas in the evening, he was generally home by like four or five o'clock. He was kind of, at that point, the family man. Investigators collected his trash, hoping to find something incriminating something to link him to Suzette Troughton or to his cloudy past. Besides his residence, Robinson also owned a small farm with several houses on it. Detective Lehman photographed it. Just to the right of the residence was a small shed, and next to the small shed, where it just looked like some, some junk, like some lawn mowers, uh, barrels, things like that, just kind of overgrown area. But a more immediate clue was coming together at the police station, where a bag of shredded documents was found among Robinson's trash. Strip by strip, detectives found their next leads. Phone records, credit card bills, and internet records. But one piece of evidence stood out. We found a bill for storage locker over in Raymore, Missouri. 
when investigators went over there to talk storage. to the storage company, they were able to find that John Robinson actually had another locker there at, the, at that same site, but it was actually in one of the other victim's names. At this point, all the police had were suspicions. They would need some hard evidence to secure a warrant to search the storage locker. They turned to his phone records for that evidence. The records indicated that he'd called Suzette hundreds of times, but not after he checked her out of the hotel. He'd also placed calls to several other women, including two in Canada. Some of these women were later found to have visited Robinson in Kansas hotels, as Suzette had done. Every name we ran across associated with John Robinson, we looked at as potential victims. The Suzette Troughton investigation began to suggest Robinson's larger pattern of criminal behavior. Yeah, we got one over here I think you need to take a look at. Yeah, we had no idea what their role in this entire game was. We didn't know if possibly they were accomplices in a disappearance of Suzette. We had no idea what their role was, and we couldn't contact them because we did not want to tip off John Robinson that we were investigating him. Because the police still didn't want to tip Robinson off to the investigation, they enlisted help from Suzette's mother back like in Newport, Michigan. She agreed to help them gather information about him by recording his phone conversations. She would keep calling him, demanding information about her daughter, hoping he would incriminate himself. But he was too slick. He told her that Suzette was traveling with another man and he hadn't heard from her either. He never said anything that would help police. Robinson's story seemed unlikely, but the calls did appear to prompt a letter from Suzette, postmarked San Jose. Her mother remained unconvinced. Everything about it was wrong, from what Suzette said to the fact that it was typed. Again, Carolyn Troughton notified the police. Paul Morrison was the Johnson County, Kansas DA assigned to the case. And these letters that are trickling in from Mexico, from California, talking about what a great time she's having with this uh, new gentleman that she's taken up with. We didn't believe it for a second, but I, I think the point here is, is that, uh, number one, we didn't know if we were ever going to find her body. We did believe that she was dead, and we knew early on that we were dealing with somebody that is much more sophisticated than your typical criminal. It seemed John Robinson had a talent for getting away with his crimes, including the disappearances of three other Kansas women more than a decade earlier. From what investigators could tell, everything Robinson did was spun out of deceit. He was a con artist. Uh, most of his crimes involved financial crimes. He never worked for a business that he didn't rip off. And from what we could tell, he never met anybody he didn't rip off. Just as police were beginning to fear they may never learn the truth about John Robinson, they got a call from a woman who had seen him for the man he truly was. In Kansas, Suzette Troughton is missing and presumed dead. Police fear the suspect, John Robinson, may be a serial killer, but they have no proof. She had to go find John. Until they receive a desperate call from a terrified woman. I was in my room. Robinson had lured her from Texas. And she now gave police some crucial information. Sergeant Rick Roth was one of the principal investigators. The woman had gone to the office, in a rather agitated state, and asked who had rented the room that she was in. Uh, management told her it was John Robinson. This woman knew him as James Turner. That further infuriated her and she started yelling and screaming about the fact that uh, she had been battered and that he had stolen from her.
Armed with this victim's statement, police finally had what they needed to confront John Robinson directly. When they arrived, he was home alone. Mr. Robinson, a couple of things that we want to talk to you about. They asked him about Suzette Troughton and other missing women. I think I want he to pled ignorance. Him. We'll just hold it right there because actually you're under arrest. For what? Investigators arrested him for battery and felony theft based on the Texas woman's statement. Search warrant in hand, a small army of detectives and crime scene officers descended upon Robinson's home. As the suspect himself was shuttled off for questioning at police headquarters. It appeared Robinson lured vulnerable women to Kansas with the promise of friendship, jobs, or exciting sex. He set his trap using email, so investigators confiscated his computers. Police also collected bills for storage lockers, credit card statements, and hotel receipts. Lenexa detective Dawn Lehman notes some of the other discoveries. We recovered several books on creating new identities, uh, make someone disappear, things like that. Uh, we recovered letterhead from, uh, you know, CIA, DEA, ATF. We even collected several pieces of information from some of the women from the early 80s uh, that he had kept documents of or notes, uh, probably to keep track of who he had spoken to with their families. Missing was any evidence leading to Suzette Troughton. Investigators hoped to find it in his computers. Detective Mike Jacobson of the Overland Park, Kansas PD was assigned the task of analyzing the contents of Robinson's computers. What they wanted us to look for were other victims. Are there other pictures of women or men on these computer systems, uh, people that we don't know about? And in fact, we did find some of those types of pictures. Uh, they wanted to know about communications. Were there communications between John Robinson and others, specifically Suzette Troughton and uh, other victims as they were identified? Investigators determined that the email supposedly sent by Suzette to her family in fact, originated from John Robinson's email account. That suggested that Robinson himself had sent them. Police hoped for a more substantial link in Robinson's storage units. I don't know if at that point we ever thought that there was actually, you know, bodies or anything in the storage lockers, but we felt that there was something that would connect him to these to these missing women. They weren't disappointed. Investigators found Suzette's luggage, her computer, clothing, identification, and other personal possessions. Here's Suzette's uh, driver's license and her social security card. More incriminating was a stack of stationery pre-signed with Suzette's signature. It was accompanied by a list of addresses and birthdays of Suzette's friends and family. This was the first real indication that well, Suzette was dead. Uh, uh, but if police were going to prove she had been murdered, they had to find her body. Investigators started at the place Robinson knew best, his own farm. Cadaver dogs led officers through the brush and right to a pair of large barrels. Detectives meticulously broke the seal on one of them. Inside, they found a body. The second barrel also contained a body. They now had proof that John Robinson was a killer. Detective Greg Wilson of the Overland Park, Kansas PD. We don't deal with a lot of murders, thank goodness. 
when you become a police officer, you hope that you never have to deal with a situation like this. You know, the whole thing was almost overwhelming. Now, investigators had to determine what had happened to these victims and who they were. It was an enormous challenge. One they presented to Shawnee County, Kansas Deputy Coroner, Donald Poyman. Normally, the bodies come in a sealed body bag, and we know how to examine the bodies. In this case, just deciding how to get the bodies out of the barrels and preserve the evidence was a very tricky situation. Um, not only because of the logistics of them being extremely heavy, but we had a lot of tissue that had liquefied. Poyman determined that both victims were young females, and both were killed by a hammer strike to the skull. One had been dead about a month, the other up to two years. Upon learning that the bodies had been found on his land, Robinson asked to speak with his lawyer. Robinson, the, you said that you Investigators respected his request, but not before showing him the room full of evidence they had gathered against him. It included photos of his victims, maps, and surveillance logs. Investigators believed it was finally Robinson's time to wait. After months of investigating suspected serial killer John Robinson, authorities in Kansas finally had him in custody. From the local jail, he and his lawyer were trying to find a way to yeah, prove his John. innocence. Uh, I've been arrested for sexual so far, the only charges against him were battery and larceny related to the woman from Texas. But with two bodies found on his property, Sergeant Rick Roth was determined not to stop until he had brought this man he believed was a cold-blooded murderer to justice. Robinson had slipped away once before. This time, he would not get away. This was a huge case, biggest case ever worked at Lenox uh, as far as manpower and time. Uh, for two and a half months, we threw every detective we had into it. And then after Robinson was arrested, I mean, it had increased to like 35 detectives working this case. It was a huge strain on manpower. Females, adult females. Investigators focused their attention on the evidence. Their first job was to identify the victims found on Robinson's farm. Dr. Daniel Winter, forensic odontologist, was asked to assist with the identification. In the case of Suzette Troughton, we were provided anti-mortem charts and x-rays by her treating dentist. I took x-rays and, and charted and took photographs also. If Winter could match the two sets of x-rays, then he could say with certainty that investigators had found the body of Suzette Troughton. We see fillings that are identical between the anti-mortem and the post-mortem x-rays. These are enough points to make a positive identification. Dental records proved that one of the victims was Suzette Troughton. Investigators also ID'd the other victim as a woman who had been reported missing. They then focused all energy on connecting Robinson to Suzette's murder. They began by studying the letters Suzette's mother had received. Here, too, the tale would be told in the lab. At the Kansas City Police Department, Chief Criminalist Frank Booth extracted DNA from Suzette's body. He hoped to compare it against cellular material pulled from the envelopes that Suzette supposedly sent her family. He wanted to see who had actually sent the letters. If I can detect that underneath the flap of the envelope, I can then know that I've got an indication I've got saliva. In addition to that, you also slough off epithelial cells from the inside lining of your mouth. These cells are very distinctive in their appearance, and they also contain the DNA that it can identify who licked the envelope. It wasn't Suzette Troughton. The DNA on the envelopes matched a sample taken from John Robinson. He must have sent the letters to avoid arousing suspicion about Suzette's fate. Robinson's connection with Suzette was linked at a molecular level. Hair and blood cells found in Robinson's storage unit 
were consistent with Suzette's. And a fingerprint on Suzette's driver's license belonged to Robinson. I believe Suzette Troughton thought she had the opportunity of a lifetime when she traveled down here. She was supposed to get a salary of $65,000 a year, a, a leased car. She was supposed to stay in a five-bedroom mansion. She was going to travel the world with John Robinson and his elderly father, which was supposed to be her job, was taking care of him. She never saw it coming. It couldn't be disputed. John Robinson murdered Suzette Troughton and several other women. The evidence had finally caught up with him. It was a fact that did not surprise DA Paul Morrison. John Robinson had been killing people for over a decade and a half, and he'd never been caught. He knew he'd been investigated at least a time or two for that, and he'd always beat it. So I think to a certain extent, there's a certain amount of arrogance that comes into play, and John Robinson is a very arrogant man. But John Robinson could not outsmart the evidence. He was charged with two counts of capital murder and one count of first-degree murder. He received the death penalty. John Robinson crafted elaborate schemes to get close to his victims. And in the end, this lethal proximity made it impossible for him to hide. But when the killer is a stranger who strikes and then vanishes, he or she can become nearly invisible. New York, a city of glamour and grit, a town of dreams and all too often harsh realities. In June 1998, a woman on her way to work can't believe what she sees. A body lies across the stairwell of her East Harlem apartment building. The woman called police. The NYPD and an emergency medical team arrived within minutes. But there was no emergency. It was clear that the young woman had been dead for some time. Investigators determined she had been sexually assaulted. And with no identification, that was all they knew about her. Homicide detective Rob Mooney had his work cut out for him. We weren't sure if she lived in the building that she was found in. And because of the lack of obvious trauma, there was no real cause of death obvious at the scene. Investigators would have to wait for the autopsy to determine how she died. The detectives that initially responded to the scene carried it as what we call an investigate DOA because there was no cause of death known to them and nothing obvious and there wasn't anybody at the scene telling us what happened to this woman. At the medical examiner's office, the autopsy confirmed that the victim had been sexually assaulted. The technicians performed a rape kit and collected DNA evidence in the event they identified a suspect. The autopsy also showed that her death was not an accident. The medical examiner's office gives us the cause of death as asphyxiation due to chest compression, meaning that somebody or something was heavy enough and exerted enough pressure on her chest to cause her to be unable to breathe. Police went back to the apartment building and canvassed the residents to find out if anyone knew anything about the girl. No one had seen or heard anything suspicious. And no one had ever seen the girl before. Then, investigators got a call from a woman who was worried that her daughter was missing. Police spoke with the mother. She told them her daughter's name was Rashida Washington. She described Rashida as an ambitious 18-year-old who was working to put herself through college. Police now had a name to try to match with the victim. The police department has a unit that's assigned to the medical examiner's office, a missing persons unit that works there. And when they get a, a report of a missing person, they normally 
through course normal business will match up missing persons reports with unidentified remains. And that, that was how that was, the identification was made. We have a victim. The woman found murdered was Rashida Washington. The young lady over on 720 West. But no one knew how she ended up dead in the building. Washington. It was several blocks from her home she identified. She works and wasn't late. anywhere near her college campus. She was going to New York City Community College. Could you check on that? Get the Investigators went to the school she attended. Hey, how's it going? Good. They pored over her class lists, looking for someone who could connect her to the building where she was found. They could find no link. There seemed to be no logical reason for her to be in that building. Next, they went to the dress shop where she worked. They hoped that possibly the manager could shed some light on the mystery of what happened to Rashida Washington. Last time I saw the manager her, told them that Rashida first. stayed late my, uh, and did not mention any plans she had made after work. We found out that she had left work, I think about 9.30 at night, the, the last day that uh, she was alive. And as far as anybody could tell, took the train as she normally did and then never made it home. First, Police hit another dead end. Investigators again turned to those closest to Rashida. It's important to find out who's responsible. We can't give it a, a slow approach. It's got to be done right, and it's got to be done as quickly as possible to try to prevent further crimes from being committed. They were trying to find out if she had any enemies, anyone she was arguing with, or if she was mixed up with the wrong crowd. Her family and friends and co-workers were shocked to find out that she had been the victim of a murder. She is not, was not the kind of person that you would normally find in, in this position. Desperate for answers, Rashida's family and friends posted flyers throughout the neighborhood. Clearly, because we had no real lead to work on at that stage of the game, then you have to start with her and you start to talk to all the people around her. And then that circle begins to expand as you go on to see if we can find out exactly what happened to her. Rashida's case was pretty much of a mystery. With no information to go on, the Rashida Washington rape and murder investigation faltered. Then, three months later, police confronted another case of rape. This time, the victim survived. She accused a resident of her apartment building. The man was arrested and imprisoned for the crime. But in this case, investigators may not have gotten the right man. In New York City, Police are struggling to solve the murder of 18-year-old Rashida Washington. They believe that they have their suspect behind bars. But cutting-edge science is about to point the investigation in a new direction. In 1998, state and federal crime labs were setting up DNA databases for criminal cases. while adding the DNA from the perpetrator of the second rape into the database. The lab made two crucial and totally unexpected discoveries. First, the man imprisoned for the crime was innocent. And second, the real culprit had also raped and murdered Rashida Washington. Homicide detective Rob Mooney the linking of the two cases through DNA was huge for us. That was a huge break. Um, it did not, at that point, tell us who the perpetrator was, but it did tell us that there was at least one person responsible for at least two cases. Um, and it gave us a lot more material to work with 
because we have a live victim now. We have somebody that's seen the person that killed Rashida Washington can still tell us about. It. So the IDs were made by something else. So but the information from the database did not stop there. Really it appeared to Karen Dooling, who was an assistant director at the DNA lab for New York City's medical examiner, that the rapist who had turned murderer had been on a spree. Originally, you had these two investigations that were thought to be completely separate, and one of those investigations was even thought to be part of a completely separate pattern, and how these two cases linked together. And as time went on, you know, within the next year or two in the laboratory, cases continued to link to this pattern, cases that people had no idea were this same perpetrator or that were linked to each other. From interviews with the surviving rape victim, police developed a sketch of the suspect. It was widely circulated around the college Rashida attended and throughout the city. The investigators' hard work paid off. A woman called with an anonymous tip She's pretty certain that the, the person in the sketch is somebody that lives in her building on East 111th Street. She supplies us with the address of the building and a nickname, Ace, that she's picked up from having had contact with this person in the building. So the detectives then begin to search our databases for people at that address using that nickname. It brings them their first suspect, a man named Aaron Key. Who had a record for robbery, weapons possession, drugs, and other crimes. He resembles the sketch. In addition, the surviving rape victim provided another piece of crucial information. According to prosecutor Rich Plansky. At the crime scene, the perpetrator discarded a sweatshirt and a baseball cap. Um, she was positive that the person who raped her was wearing both. And as it turned out, the, um, the sweatshirt had a partial laundry tag on the back. Following the only real clue they had, investigators approached dry cleaners near Key's apartment. Tell me, sir, do you recognize the tag? One cleaner recognized the distinctive tag as coming from his establishment. He handed over his client list. Copy. Key's mother was Thank on it. Very much. I'll give you a card. If you, uh, in addition to the woman cards. in the building telling us that this is the person that she thinks is responsible for these crimes, we identify who that nickname belongs to, and we have that same person perhaps being the owner of this shirt that's left behind at the rape. So it becomes a fairly intense surveillance on Aaron at this stage of the game. We're watching him 24 hours a day in an effort to try to secure something that will yield a DNA sample. If he smokes a cigarette and throws it on the ground, if he spits out gum and throws it on the ground, if he drinks a soda and throws the bottle in the garbage, get it. Aaron Key does none of those things. He always seems to be one step ahead of them. But police get lucky when he stumbles. So we fill out a wanted card for Aaron Key, which means that if he gets arrested any place else in New York City, we'll get notified immediately so that we can do whatever we need to do with this person. And what happens is Aaron gets arrested in uh, Midtown North for an attempted pettit larceny. Believing this is their chance to finally get a DNA sample, police tell Key they need to swab his cheek to test for TB before they lock him up. But the problem here is, in order for us to be able to use that legally, he had to sign a release that clearly states this is going to be typed for DNA and it's going to be put into the medical examiner's data bank. The second that he read that, he was like, Nah, you know what? He goes, I joined Jehovah's Witnesses recently, and I don't think I can do this until I consult with the elders in my church. And you know, that was the end of that. Not quite the end. Though Key did all he could to conceal his DNA, 
the authorities stayed one step ahead. They kept a close eye on him in prison, and a guard collected coffee cups from key and adjacent inmates. All of them are tested for DNA. All of them produce DNA. But one of them produces DNA that matches the evidence in all of these cases. Investigators believed that Aaron Key was the assailant in all five cases. They simply had to match his DNA to the DNA in the database. But because of the huge number of records on file, that would take time. Time the investigators did not have. With only a petty larceny charge against him, police had to let him go. They try to keep him under surveillance, but he manages to slip away. We have no clue where he is at this stage of the game. So now um, it becomes kind of a media blitz the next day. His picture is on the front page of the newspapers because that very morning that he disappears is the day that we get the DNA match back. So he's our guy. Rapist, killer, escape artist. Aaron Key is on the loose, and he could be anywhere. In New York, DNA has linked 34-year-old Aaron Key to five rapes and two murders. But the suspect has fled. Detectives kept an eye on his apartment for days, just in case he returned. Then, late one night, a light went on. Police wasted no time. But the man inside was not Aaron Key. It was his roommate. Key wasn't there and hadn't been there for days. His roommate didn't know where he was. But at that instant, the phone rang. That's all right. No, answer it for me, please. The roommate Hello. picks up the telephone, and I could tell just by the look on his face that it was Aaron that was on the phone. I said, give me the phone. They said, you got to come in. Every cop in New York City's got your picture right now. Key agrees to meet with Detective Mooney to turn himself in. He says, but I don't want to step out and have 100 cops jumping on me. He says, I just want you by yourself, meet me in the street. So I go, OK, no problem. I said, but make no mistake about it. Don't come in the block with your hands in your pockets, or we're going to have a problem. Police don't want to play any games with Key. And they get his cell phone records to try to pinpoint where he was making the call. They want to pick him up before he has a chance to run again. But they are too late. While I'm having this conversation with him, where he's telling me that he's on a number six train on his way uptown to come and turn himself in, he's actually at Penn Station in Newark, New Jersey. Police then set about using credit card and phone records to try to find Aaron Key. The trail leads them south. I call up our tech people and I say, listen, dump this phone right now, meaning the phone that was the receiving end of that telephone call. Uh, we have that number. I want of all the phone calls that came in between these two time periods. They determined that this telephone call came from a phone booth in downtown Miami. The next morning, myself and another detective were on a flight. After arriving in Florida, police tracked down the phone booth Key used. It was located directly in front of a hotel. We pull into the parking lot, and we're setting up, and we're figuring we're going to be here all day sitting here watching this hotel to see what happens. And not five minutes later, here comes Aaron walking down the street, and he's with a young girl. So I'm thinking, this is bad. This is like victim number nine walking right past us here. New York detectives, accompanied by Miami police and SWAT team, descended upon the hotel and sealed the exits. Let's go upstairs. They've got Key trapped, along with all of the other guests and hotel staff.
law enforcement swept the hotel, room by room, in search of the elusive key. We have an emergency. For your own safety, we need you to clear the building right now. At last, they find him. Key puts up no resistance, and the girl is safe. If police hadn't found him so quickly, the girl might have become his next victim. Their quick okay. reactions probably saved her life. Key was extradited to New York, where he spent several hours denying his involvement. Even in the face of scientific evidence, investigators needed to find a way to get Key to talk. And one of them suggested that maybe his girlfriend could get him to confess. Against Detective Mooney's better judgment, Key's girlfriend was allowed to see him. And he spills everything. He gives admits to every one of the crimes and of course cannot offer uh, an explanation for why he did it just that he did do it um this all becomes good usable evidence for us at trial because there was it was unsolicited she wasn't sent in there as an agent of the police for any reason in fact i argued that she shouldn't go into the room Though Aaron Key had girlfriends, he was a sexual predator who enjoyed taking women by force. Rashida Washington lived in the same building as Key. She must have known him. And in his mind, because she could recognize him, she had to die. Rich Plansky was the prosecutor. The case wouldn't have been solved without forensic evidence. Forensic evidence did three things in this case. Number one, it identified Aaron Key for us. Because he left his DNA on five of our seven victims, in the end, it told us this was the right guy. Number two, it exonerated a number of innocent people, two of whom had been arrested and identified in lineups for two of the rapes. And number three, it was instrumental in helping us convict Aaron Key and putting him away for the rest of his life. Key was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The bottom line is this person is, is off the board forever. You won't see him anymore. And had he not been taken off the board, more crimes would certainly have been committed. A killer's motivation remains a mystery, but the residue of his crime lingers. Thanks to the tireless work of forensic scientists, when a murder occurs, it is impossible for the killer to simply vanish.